and deliver innovative therapies. Their advances in hemophilia treatment and serving that community have spanned decades, and we are grateful they are supporting this overview of gene therapy and hemophilia today. I'm joined today by Betsy Caval. Thank you for taking the time to join us. I'll go ahead and turn it over to you to get us started. Well, thank you everyone, and thank you for being with us today as we launch into our talk today about gene therapy and hemophilia. Now, my name is Betsy Koval, as I just um, said. I'm gonna be a speaker for this program and I'm an employee of CSL. And my background is that I'm a nurse and I've worked at a hemophilia treatment center in Atlanta with adult and pediatric patients. But I want you to remember that the information being shared today is just for educational purposes only. It's not intended to be medical advice. So for any questions that you have regarding medical treatments, please speak with your treating healthcare provider. So the purpose of today's presentation, now I'm gonna be sharing with you an overview on how CSL Bearing is sharing the science behind gene therapy so that patients, caregivers, community members can have an understanding when they're talking to their doctor or trying to get some questions answered. My role at CSSL Bearing is a patient resource navigator. It's a unique position that I'm very lucky to have. I work with patients and the community to educate on the science of gene therapy as well as support those who've decided to move forward in their journey with gene therapy. So this is what we're gonna be speaking about today. I'm gonna to be speaking about hemophilia broadly when it comes to explaining some of the science. We're gonna be then bringing it in and talking about gene therapy and hemophilia. We're gonna have a Q&A at the end, so stay with us, because you, know, you may have one of these questions as well. So let's go ahead and dive right into the details, okay? So first of all, I want to say thank you for joining today, and I'm really glad that, that everyone here could join, because we're here today to learn. We're gathered because we all come from some common experiences as part of this community. I appreciate you taking the time to gain knowledge, because becoming educated helps the whole community as we support each other and educate those outside the community as we advocate for ourselves and those who share this journey with us. Now, as part of the bleeding disorders community, you are probably more aware of the different types of bleeding disorders and can recall them more easily than many other people. Now, we're not gonna be discussing them all, but there are some common experiences that are shared by those who do have bleeding disorders. So, as mentioned, we're gonna be speaking about gene therapy today and then move more specifically into gene therapy about hemophilia. So we're gonna open up and kind of level set with a discussion about hemophilia. Now, as you see on the screen, some of you may be surprised because there are three types of hemophilia, hemophilia A, hemophilia B, and hemophilia C. They all carry a common name but each of these disorders has its own very unique identity. All of them represent a person who may experience prolonged bleeding. Now, we're familiar with hemophilia A and B and that the big impact for those affected are the joint and muscle and spontaneous bleeding. Now, many people um, then also experience joint disease with hemophilia A and B because of that joint bleeding. Now, for hemophilia C, joint bleeding rarely, if ever, occurs, with most bleeding occurring after trauma or surgery, and typically involves those mucocutaneous areas, you know, like the mouth, the teeth, tonsils, the GI tract, or the urinary tract, you know, after a procedure like circumcision. Also, I was reminded recently that hemophilia C has another difference from hemophilia A and B, Hemophilia C is not carried on the X chromosome. It's carried on a numbered chromosome. Now, all of these things, all of these hemophilias have something in common other than prolonged bleeding. 
the thing that they have in common is that they're monogenic. It's just one gene to affect or create disease. So when it comes to comparing hemophilia C to hemophilia A and B, it's kind of like comparing apples to oranges. Both are fruit. But if you take a minute and you compare hemophilia B to hemophilia A, well, that's more like comparing apples to pears because they have a lot more similarities and their symptoms are strikingly similar. But there are some differences and we're gonna discuss them. So I want you to kind of put on your thinking caps and get ready to look at some of those more easily identifiable differences. So if we look at the differences between heme A and heme B, one of the first things that may come to mind is that there are two different factors that are affected. Hemophilia A is for factor A, and hemophilia B is for factor nine. But also the number of people who are affected by each type is very different because hemophilia B is much less common. Hemophilia A is about four to five times more common and if you have von Willebrand's disease and happen to be listening, you know, I want to add that VWD is the most common bleeding disorder, as so many of you may know. The next difference is how long are the standard half-life in plasma per factor? Because the length of time in plasma, the standard half-life for factor eight, is about eight to 12 hours. Now, for factor nine, it's 18 to 24 hours. But a key difference that I always remember is that the size of the factor nine protein is about 57 kilodaltons. What's kilodaltons? It's a scientific unit of measurement. Now factor eight is five to six times larger at 293 kilodaltons. So if you want to compare the two, it's kind of like factor nine is just the size of the back of my fist or a tennis ball compared to factor eight, which would be about the size of a small beach ball. So the size difference is pretty significant. Now for those with VWD, again, I'll mention this because VWF, that protein is one of the largest coagulation factors in circulation. And its size range is anywhere from 500 to 20,000 kilodaltons. That's a big difference. So when you compare factor nine, factor eight, those have a pretty big difference in their protein size. Now, there are a lot of other differences between factor eight and factor nine, but that's a good start. Let's go ahead and look at some other differences that we may see. Because treatment for hemophilia has changed over time, from using plasma in the 50s to the introduction of freeze-dried or lyophilized powder, in the 1970s to the 1990s with the arrival of the recombinant products. And we've seen improved outcomes for people with hemophilia, which have been achieved through prophylaxis therapy, with the mainstay of treatment being factor replacement or replacing what's missing, the factor that's missing. Now, factor replacement therapy provides missing coagulation factors and can be used for prophylaxis as well as on-demand management. Those standard half-life therapies that are available can treat hemophilia A, hemophilia B, some types of von Willebrand's disease, as well as other rare factor deficiencies. And dosing is so variable depending on the disease as well as the product, from daily, every other day, three times a week, twice a week, once a week. But all of this really depends on the person. Now, extended half-life therapies are used to treat hemophilia A and hemophilia B. Now, those extended half-life therapies are formulated in such a way that, you know, that it delays the breakdown of the factor in the body. Now, with the EHL therapies, people with hemophilia can reduce the number of infusions that are needed and get that same level of protection, or they can um, increase that trough level for better bleed protection or a combination of both. But when you look at the, um, how the factor works in the body, dosing 
and how they're dosed is going to be very, very independent of that person or dependent on that person. Now, plus, I want you to look at the waves that you see in the purple here. People who have hemophilia and use traditional factor replacement therapies must contend with the peaks and troughs in their factor levels. Some of you reading this slide may experience some of this that's listed. Some of you may be well controlled, but even with the many prophylactic treatments that are available, people living with hemophilia are still facing challenges. Since factor replacement is prophylactic, it requires a consistent infusion schedule. Now, most DHL therapies, you can kind of spread out perhaps that time frame that you may need it, but you've got to be well controlled. Having to follow a rigid and frequent infusion schedule can be cumbersome, but it can also increase that risk for delayed doses or missed doses. That never happens to anybody now, does it? But if you do miss or delay a dose, it can be detrimental to your treatment goals. Now, venous access can become limited with all the frequent infusions, and veins can become hard or they can be difficult to access, especially if you had a bleed and you're trying to find a new spot. The need for lifetime treatment requiring these frequent infusions or injections, the time required for prophylaxis, all of that can contribute to poor patient adherence to therapy. Now, although the replacement therapies have really been great in helping to prevent long-term damage, we still see that those breakthrough bleeds occur and they still cause joint damage. And you now joint damage and pain really gets in the way. I mean, it can limit your participation in your life whether it's your work life, doing the physical activities you want, time with family or social things. So there's still a need to decrease these burdens and increase quality of life. So here we are. We're gonna be taking um, a little bit of a look into how gene therapy works in hemophilia. And I'm gonna be speaking about hemophilia broadly when explaining it how it works as we get into the science, okay? So let's jump right in. Vast improvements have occurred over time. Now, if we go back in history, there have been many pivotal moments that have gotten us to where we are today. In 1982, the factor IX gene was cloned, and a couple of years later, in 84, factor VIII gene was cloned. All of these steps have supported treatment that we know today. Now, on demand has been highly effective in stopping bleeds, but it never reverses the long-term damage that follows a bleed. Now, regular treatment can prevent bleeding, but it's kind of invasive and it's difficult to maintain that schedule. So there's still a burden of treatment that affects quality of life for many of those affected but the treatment paradigm continues to move forward. And if you see on the right that gold bar, gene therapy represents an exciting advancement in treatment for those with hemophilia with a goal of providing sustained factor levels to minimize those peaks and troughs. In other words, providing a steady state where factor levels can remain relatively constant with minimal fluctuations. So let's talk a little bit more about gene therapy. It's a big topic. Let's go. So gene therapy is an innovative approach that changes a person's genes to treat a disease. It's to provide a long-term treatment to correct a disorder. Now, there are three key techniques to gene therapy. We'll start at the top in the gold. Gene addition or gene transfer introduces a correctly working copy of a defective or a missing gene. So you're adding a gene 
to bypass a problem. And then in the center is gene inactivation or silencing. This type of gene therapy turns off the gene that's not functioning properly. So you're doing something to censor or interrupt the information on a gene from being read. The third approach is genome editing or gene editing. Now, as you can see by the scissors, it involves the use of some sort of editing tool to remove or replace sections of targeted genes. So this approach is used to disrupt harmful genes or to repair mutated ones. Now, gene therapy for hemophilia involves gene addition or gene transfer. And you just heard that is where we introduce a correctly working copy of a gene. This is going to be the focus of our conversation today. So this type of gene therapy provides a working copy of a gene, but it does not remove the copy of the gene that does not function properly. So with gene transfer, the new gene gives the cells the information of what to do, like a manual of instructions on how to make a missing protein. But since the defective gene is not removed, a father as hemophilia will still be able to pass on the gene for hemophilia to his children after this type of gene therapy. I kind of like to think of gene addition or gene transfer like this. You have a cookbook or a book. It gives you all kinds of directions on how to set a table, buy meat, cook all the great foods. Now, there is a recipe in this book that actually I've tried to make and it hasn't turned out. I don't know what it is, whether it's the ingredients or the instructions, I just don't know. But my grandmother has a recipe and that recipe is foolproof. Every time you make it, it turns out just right. So I take this recipe and I add it into this cookbook. It's always there when I need it. I'm not taking pages out of the cookbook. I'm not changing the order. I'm not folding pages in. All I'm doing is adding in the correct information. That's how I like to think of gene therapy but I've had a lot of questions. So I wanna kind of take a step back to the basics for a minute. So we've been talking about genes, you've heard about chromosomes, and then there's DNA. And all of them come together to work to make you who you are. Now chromosomes, and we hear about that with hemophilia A and B, because they're on the X chromosome. But they carry DNA in cells. DNA is responsible for building and maintaining your whole human structure. Now, DNA is the building blocks that arrange themselves to form the directions on how to make proteins and are unique to every person. Genes, which what we're discussing here, are segments of your DNA. So using that cookbook analogy, you might be able to say that the ingredients are like the DNA. The chromosomes are like my cookbook, and the genes are the pages of the recipes inside the cookbook. So now let's get into some of the approaches for gene addition or gene transfer. It's in vivo in the gold and ex vivo in the kind of a blue, I guess. But I also want to tell you, you're getting an added benefit today because you're going to be learning a little bit of Latin. So in vivo stands for, in Latin, in the body. This type of gene therapy directly introduces the vector into the patient to deliver a functional gene to targeted cells. Now, in vivo therapy can del be delivered to patients either intravenously or with an injection into target tissue. Now, ex vivo is Latin for outside of the body. Now, this type of gene therapy is a bit different because stem cells are extracted from the patients to start. 
then outside of the body, a functional gene is then integrated or given to those cells. And they are, that's done using a type of vector called an integrating vector. Then these cells are returned to the patient. Now, currently, both ex vivo and in vivo gene therapy approaches are being used in approved treatments of inherited monogenic diseases. So now you know of a couple of different approaches. Let's go in a little bit further. When it comes to hemophilia, or when you tell someone that you have hemophilia, many of you are gonna say, well, I'm missing a certain factor protein in my body, or a certain factor. That's what I need, it helps me clot. But what's really missing is the gene that tells the body how to make it. The gene is the manual of instructions on how to make a protein. So the absence or defect in only one gene alters the body's ability to be able to produce a functioning factor protein. So it is, again, monogenic or one gene affected, like I mentioned earlier. So hemophilia is a very promising target when it comes to gene therapy because it is a condition or a defect in a single gene and can theoretically be treated by just importing a working gene. So for hemophilia A, that's a factor A gene. For hemophilia B, it's a factor IX gene. So when that gene is going to be delivered, it's going to be inserted into a vector or a delivery device. It's then going to be infused via a single infusion. The working gene then is going to go in and go to the cells of the liver and therefore the people who receive this, their liver is unable to begin making their own factor. This is a quiz, just think about it. Based on the previous slide, which type of approach is being shown here? In vivo or ex vivo? It's in vivo. I don't want to get too far ahead of myself. So I really want to talk about how the whole process starts next. First of all, you have to start with a working gene. It's got to be a correctly working copy or portion of the DNA, genetic material that's to be transferred. In other programs, you may have heard it called a trans gene. For a gene to be delivered to the body, it must be contained in something. Now, this container is important because it's going to protect that genetic material as it's being delivered or in transit, kind of like a box with an address on it. Now, the delivery system that gets the working gene to the correct cells in the body is an inactive viral shell. When it's empty, it's called a capsid. Now, this delivery system or viral shell must meet the needs of the genetic material. If it's too big or too small or wrong type, it can really make getting delivery of the genetic information where it's supposed to go difficult, but also for the body to be able to do what it needs to when it receives it to make a functioning protein, very difficult as well. Now, once that genetic information is loaded in, to that empty viral shell, it begins to be called a vector. Now, there are really a lot of other factors that help influence the success of gene therapy, but the AAV or that viral shell plays a major role in success of gene therapy. So let's recall a little bit about what we spoke of earlier with regards to gene therapy. We've mentioned that an adeno-associated virus, or an AAV, is a deactivated virus. It's been, its contents have been completely removed, so its ability to cause illness has been eliminated. Now it's able, as a completely empty shell, to take on a new task to deliver a therapy. So 
when that adeno-associated virus, that shell, is empty, it's considered a capsid that you see in the blue on the left. It has a protein coating on it that acts like an address for that particular AAV of where it's to be delivered. Now, once you add genetic material or the factor gene and load it into the AAV, that capsid, it changes names. It becomes a vector, as you can see on the far right. I know it sounds confusing, but let me give you a little analogy. I'm a lady, and when I have a child, I'm very protective, but my name changes. I become a mom. I also take on a new role when I do that. So maybe that would help you in seeing that transition of the name. But you may have also noted the words liver-specific promoter in the center. Now, a promoter is a part of the genetic information that tells the right cell where to start reading the instructions. It's like adding not just an address to a package, but a zip code to the address. This liver-specific promoter is so the specific liver cells can read it. Now, the most common vectors or delivery vehicles being considered are called adeno-associated viruses, or AAVs. Now, they have been developed from a virus known as an adeno-associated virus, and they have been changed so that they're unable to cause a viral infection in humans. I think we mentioned this earlier, but these AAVs do not have the ability to replicate or reproduce themselves. So as we look at the screen, the AAV vector delivers the gene to its destination. And remember, with gene transfer, gene in addition, that working gene is inserted into that empty shell and it becomes a vector. The vector is going to deliver this gene to its destination through a one-time infusion. Now, that protein coating on the outside acts as that general delivery address of where that vector is to go in the body. Once the new gene reaches its destination, in this case the liver, all those copies of the gene are delivered to the cell so that the body can begin to produce factor. But wait a minute, wait a minute. Why are we using a virus? Well, I've got a story for that. Just kidding. Viruses are really smart. They've been around for a long, long time. And viruses are very good at getting into cells. So a lot of people, interesting, have already been exposed to AAVs at some point in our life because they exist naturally in the world. But the majority of the AAV vectors don't change your DNA. They just deliver the working gene to the targeted part of the body. So some people may say, yikes, the idea of putting a virus in your body is scary, but these AAVs are adeno-associated viruses. They can't make you sick. They're just empty shells. They're the delivery vehicle. A lot of consideration goes into deciding about these vectors or viruses. So for successful gene therapy, Vectors must be able to deliver the gene successfully. And an ideal gene transfer therapy vector has specific criteria it must meet. It should allow a durable effect with a one-time administration and deliver that working gene to the correct part of the body, like to the heart or the eye or the liver. It should enable treatment to the largest number of people and it should be targeted for little impact on others. Be specific. AAV-based gene therapy approaches are being explored for hemophilia A and for hemophilia B. Now, currently gene therapy using AAV is the most common approach for both hemophilia A and hemophilia B. Now, if we recall something that we discussed at the very beginning of the program, the size of the factor eight 
and factor IX proteins are quite different, with factor VIII being much, much larger than that of factor IX, if you remember my beach ball to my tennis ball. Well, the gene that provides the instructions for the production of each one of these proteins is also very different in size. The gene that makes the factor VIII or the factor VIII gene is extremely large and structurally complex. In contrast, the gene that makes the factor IX is much smaller and simpler in structure. I like to say it's kind of like comparing a flight manual to a single piece of paper, and you know what those instructions, you know? For factor VIII, has always been known to be pretty challenging to study on a molecular basis. Now, because of that, and the smaller size and simpler structure of factor IX, earlier gene therapies were really focused on hemophilia B. Now, another difference is where the factor proteins are naturally made in the body. All gene therapy for hemophilia is targeted at liver cells. Now, factor IX, that protein is naturally made in specialized liver cells known as hepatocytes. And this is where gene therapy is being delivered, whereas factor VIII is not naturally made in hepatocytes. Another reminder of what we've discussed earlier is that hemophilia is a great target for gene therapy because it's monogenic. It's caused by a mutation in one gene. So you need to be able to deliver a singular working copy. And this could be done in a one-time infusion. Now on the right, just for those of us who love pictures to get concepts together, you'll see kind of my idea of the liver cell with the original genetic information for hemophilia inside. So if we go through the gene therapy process, we start with our vector. Remember, it's got the genetic material on the inside, and then it's going to be infused, one-time infusion, it's gonna be delivered to the liver. Now, once it gets inside, it goes to the liver cell. Now, that additional functioning gene is then introduced to the liver cell, leaving the dysfunctional gene, and then that capsid or that vector is eliminated, leaving the instructions for the cell to use. Whew. That was a lot of information that I just shared, but I hope as we close out our session, but maybe you've learned a little something. So I want to kind of close out by putting this whole process together. Now, this is a quick glance at the process and we'll look at it in more detail on the next slide, but hopefully, hopefully, fingers crossed, from the information you've learned, you might almost be able to recite this right along with me. Go ahead if you want to. So first, we have to start with our working team. It's got to develop a package of genetic instructions that's going to function properly. Next, we have our delivery vehicle. The AAVs are created, which will eventually target and enter and those targeted liver cells. Next, we're going to bring the two together. You have your shell and you have your genetic material. The package of genetic instructions is loaded into an AAV and it becomes a vector. And this is going to act like our delivery truck to get our genetic information in. But how does it get there? Through a special delivery, of course. Through a single IV infusion, the delivery truck heads towards the liver with its package. Now, once delivered, the package is going to be opened up by those cells in the liver. The package of instructions enables the liver to start generating factor with the goal of allowing a person to produce their own stable and protective levels of factor eight and factor nine. But 
the factor keeps going because after delivering its package, that AAV vector, the shell, is broken down and eliminated, like throwing away your package, your Amazon box. You only want what's inside. But the genetic instructions remain to continue allowing the body to produce factor. Despite meaningful improvements in hemophilia and treatment, there remains a need for new therapeutic options that are going to reduce the incident of bleeds, provide patients with that elevated and sustained factor levels, reduce or eliminate the need for routine prophylaxis, and reduce the burden on patients' lives. So the current standard of care for hemophilia is associated with multiple burdens. Gene therapy, which introduces a new, fully functioning or working gene to the body, can enable people with hemophilia to make stable and protective factors levels. Now this treatment may offer an alternative to routine prophylaxis for people living with moderate to severe hemophilia. For people with hemophilia, gene therapy has the potential to sustain blood clotting ability by addressing the cause of the condition, which is a faulty factor eight or a faulty factor nine gene. So thank you. I'm sure some things may have come to mind as we've gone through this information today. So I think we might have some questions and there are some big questions that you know, may have just come and you think, wow, I really wanna be able to talk to you, someone about it. But it's, some may be very particular to each individual and to their care. Now remember, for, you know, you, uh, those of you who have hemophilia, <laughs> those questions, I want you to direct those to your treating provider because they know you and they know how to work with you in your care. Now, if you have some questions and you're a provider and you may be on this call, you may want to follow up with it um, from a CSL representative. So if you're a medical professional, you can contact our medical information department by calling 1-800-504-5434 or you can email to medinfo, na at cslbearing.com. I think that there might be some questions. Yes, that was fantastic. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen just briefly. Um, my first question for you is, are all vectors the same? Well, in truth, all vectors are not the same. And let me turn off my screen sharing for just a moment. Um, because each vector has to be chosen specifically to work with that. Um, I'm sorry. Let me do that. There we go. Um, and I appreciate the questions because AAVs are being used or investigated in most of the hemophilia um, gene therapy studies. And I like to think of AAVs as a family of many children with each one or child being, being different. Um, so I guess the short answer is no. And there are many different vectors out there and many of them have um, an affinity or a special attraction to different parts of the body. So some vectors may only be attracted to heart muscle, others may be attracted to the GI tract or eye cells and the liver. Each may also interact differently with certain groups of people who've had various exposures over their life. So for gene transfer or gene addition, special selection occurs in the choice of a virus or AAV so that the genetic information gets to the correct location safely just for use by that recipient. Fantastic, thank you. So when you get gene therapy, do you still have the condition or the disease? And that is a super question. <laughs> because with gene transfer or gene addition, a correctly working copy of the gene 
or genetic information is being given to or added to this person who already has that dysfunctional copy of a gene in their body. You might recall in my cookbook analogy um, in which the recipe is being added, but nothing is being removed or altered in that cookbook. So with this type of gene therapy, gene addition, gene transfer, the original gene is not removed. The OG, original gene, can be passed on to offspring. So one still has hemophilia, but the hope is with a successful gene transfer for this person, that they would not be having the same clinical or treatment burdens associated with the disease. So I hope that answers that for you. Great, thank you. And finally, why is liver health important? Now, for me, as a former liver transplant nurse, liver health is very important. But for gene therapy, having a healthy liver is important because a lot of copies of the genes or vectors are being delivered to the liver. And the number of copies can seem overwhelming because there are a lot of cells in the liver and we're delivering a lot of copies. So the expectation is that the liver cells take this new genetic information and that those liver cells and the liver will become a factor protein factory. Um, you know, taking on a new job can be stressful, especially if you've got to become a factor production facility. So you think about the liver, it could be stressful to it. So stable factor production is the goal of gene therapy in hemophilia. So having a healthy liver increases the liver's ability to take on this additional job responsibility successfully. So having a healthy liver is really important. Wonderful, thank you so much. I would thank like you. to formally thank you again, Betsy, for taking the time to join us this afternoon. We appreciate your time and your expertise so much. Thank you. Of course, um, and I'd like to thank each one of our viewers for attending today's webinar. A special thank you to the generous support of CSL Bearing for helping to bring you today's presentation. Please note that this recorded webinar will be available on Friday, March 10th at hemophilia.org under the events tab with all of our archive webinars. Also available on the events tab is our upcoming schedule for our weekly Wednesday webinar series. Thank you again for joining us this afternoon. Have a wonderful week, and I look forward to seeing you all next week. Goodbye.